So we will continue with food from our featured speakers. As a media professional, I've had the very good fortune to be engaged by people that love to offer opinion, especially as it relates to politics, particularly uh, at my time at CNN. They say that some base their political opinions on a whim while others do the work and base their opinion on a real deep desire for progress. We have all witnessed Donna Brazile share perspective about issues that relate to minorities and to all citizens of the United States. She is not a shy woman. She is bold, she is informed, she is dedicated, and this woman is very committed. Donna Brazil is a veteran political strategist and television political commentator, and she is a woman that wears many, many hats. She is an adjunct professor, a best-selling author, a syndicated columnist, vice chair of voter registration, and the former chair for the Democratic National Committee's Voting Rights Institute. Oprah Magazine chose Ms. Brazil as one of its 20 remarkable visionaries. She was named among the 100 most powerful women by Washingtonian Magazine, top 50 women in America by Essence Magazine, and she received the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's highest award for political achievement. She serves on numerous corporate and nonprofit institutional boards. And like many of you, Miss Brazil is an entrepreneur. She is the founder and managing director of Brazil and Associates. That is a Washington DC based general consulting, grassroots advocacy and training firm. As you very well know, and you can see if you look up her bio, she has um, an extensive resume and much to share. Uh, but if I continue talking about her, we would not make the ribbon cutting ceremony that's happening. So I just want to tell you on a personal note, um, I am a huge fan of yours. I respect the work that you do. I think you are a fierce woman, and I want to grow up and be just like you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the one, the first one is from the heart, the second is from the head, the third is from the body. It is great to be here in the remarkable, beautiful city of Chicago. <laughs> to be in the state that I love in fifth grade when Mr. Marchand said, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I don't know, but I want to go to Illinois because Abraham Lincoln was born there. And they told me, no, it's another state. I said, I still want to go to Illinois. I got my card here. Ladies and gentlemen, I sat next to the president of United Airlines. I fly to friendly skies every week of my life and to sit next to the president, I wrote his name down because when I get on my flight back home the day I'm gonna tell everybody I sat next to your president. <laughs> yeah. The good news is that he's just not flying here and flying there. United is flying all across America, all across the world. And yes, United Airlines is making a difference in the communities that they're serving. I am so pleased that my airfare <laughs> is going back into the community. That $1 billion, sir, you made me so happy. I ate all my eggs this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Governor, it's so good to see you. Congratulations, sir. And I just want to let you know I'm a Catholic girl, so unlike those Baptist preachers that sometimes get up before you, I'm going to start low, go slow, rise high, strike fire, and come and sit myself down. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to see a new governor. Look at him. He's new today. New. New governor. Just took office. His hair is not gray yet. <laughs> it's all right. When it gets this color, you just know that you did something good. Let me thank, first of all, where's my, thank you for that gracious and kind introduction. She forgot to mention that I'm an actress. I've appeared on The Good Wife three times, A House of Cards twice, including this, uh, this season, episode 11, if you, you wanna. 
But Governor, after all these years in politics, I'm probably best suited for the Game of Thrones. <laughs> I've handled everything but dragons in my life. Let me just thank all of you, thank the sponsors, thank the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council, thank you to its parent organization, the National Minority Supplier Development Council, all of the amazing sponsors, all of the leaders who are here, the elected leaders, the champions of diversity and inclusion, thank you so much. Thank you for your commitment to growing our economy and creating jobs and opportunities for all Americans. And looking back at your history, you have made tremendous strides, opened so many doors, and created a pipeline that have enabled others to soar. You are the champions. You are the ones who have made it possible, and you are the leaders who are going to help grow this economy into the future. You're the ones that will clearly make a difference in the lives of so many, not just here in Chicago, but throughout the state of Illinois and the country. Every time you open that pipeline, every time you extend that lifeline, every time you give that minority and women-owned and veteran-owned, doesn't matter who owns it, but the fact is, is every time you give them an opportunity, you create a ripple effect into our economy. Indeed, you are the future of what our economy will look like if we are going to grow and succeed in the 21st century. America must have at the table every individual because we need the resources and the skills that you will bring in order for us to become and continue to be the nation that the world envy. We are the future, and you are the champions. Why you? Because there's no one better. And why now? Because tomorrow is not soon enough. I am a small business owner. I'm proud to be one. I started my first business at the age of seven. I couldn't wait. I was in single digits. I knew it. My parents, my parents were the type of working poor and the emphasis on working. So, peop so many people forget that many poor people actually work each and every day to make a difference. I should say businesses because I was a multitasking entrepreneur. I came by the energy and grit naturally, not just because grits was a staple at the table. Governor, I went to the gym this morning. I'm gonna pick on the governor since you know he's new. I went to the gym this morning, the trainer came up, and you know, I, I knew it was a gym because everybody going in there was fine. <laughs> I followed the fine people. I'm like, I'm going to work out today. I had my music on, my praise music, and I was just trying to get the, the grits going in myself. And I looked at that man, he took off his shirt. I said, oh, no, don't do that. I'm trying not to see that. <laughs> and I said, I would take off mine, but you see them buttermilk biscuits and grits I had as a little girl? You can go to Weight Watchers, you can go to all them other things. You can't slim Jim, because Jim, the buttermilk biscuits, they are really, they're in the cane syrup, okay. <laughs> but my parents, my parents taught my siblings and I to be courageous, to be respectful, to value education, our schoolwork, to be independent, to be generous, to be determined, persistent, to face adversity, and to always power forward, to give back. They taught us to believe in ourselves. Whatever needed, whatever needed doing in my family, we did it. And we took pride in our work, and we took pride in working hard because it mattered to us. Dignity came from honest work, the kind of work the job was a means to an end. The money had to be earned and earned honestly because that gave you dignity. Well, you can imagine what kind of work you do down in Louisiana. Oh yeah, it's always hot. Somebody got to cut the grass. I own the lawnmowers because when Mr. Jimmy died, Ms. Olive said, I don't know what to do with them. Well, he taught me how to fix them. So I employed my brothers. Hell, when you got eight brothers and sisters, you want them out the house too. <laughs> my brothers cut the grass. Of course, I was the entrepreneur. I made sure that we marketed the services. Yes, I secured all of the lawns. I did some of the pruning. I still do a little pruning 
every now and then, especially when it's warm outside. I won't be coming to Chicago for another couple of weeks to prune. But we made a lot of money doing that, enough money for us to put aside some dollars for college. I also had a bait and tackle business with my sisters. Oh yeah, you gotta put them to work too. We clean fish, ladies and gentlemen. I still know how to scale it down, you know? I'm from Louisiana, so we have four delightful, delicious seasons, shrimp, crab, crawfish, and oysters. Everybody's fishing for something. I learned about paying attention to detail. The knife had to be sharp and the nose keen. If anything smelled, and you know sometimes you get rotten fish, you have to throw it away. But in my family, you gave it to Miss Ethel next door because she made cat food. That was a little money too. I did what I call the prescription medicine one, sort of like ace check cashing for seniors. I go to the local pharmacy and pick up prescriptions for the seniors in the neighborhood, and they pay me for running the errand. And literally, I ran back and forth, especially during the first of the month. I helped students with their homework. I was smart enough to be a tutor. And every now and then, you know, back then, sometimes you didn't get paid with money. Sometimes seniors sent you home with fresh eggs and tomatoes and stuff from the garden. But to me, that was as good as gold, in some ways, better. I had a bank account before I was 12, and I started to contribute into my own little social security fund. I learned about teamwork. I learned what it meant to be disciplined. But I had help. I had help. I had people who were willing to give me, a little girl, an opportunity. And of course, by giving me that opportunity, you know what I did? I spread that joy as far as I could, not only with my brothers and sisters, but people in my community, other kids because I wanted everybody to be able to work and be able to pay for the kind of things that we enjoyed as kids, snowballs, pecan candy, I'm, and going to school, of course. Now, I went back to owning a business after the Gore campaign. I combined my passion and my love, my passion for social justice and my love for being an entrepreneur. I could be independent and I could continue to help people because that matters most to me. I started my company back in 2002 with one employee. Today I have over six employees, consultants, and paid interns, and this has allowed me to work for many major Fortune 500 companies across this United States of America. I am proud to have worked and helped train employees and managers for such diverse companies as ExxonMobil, General Electric, Home Depot, and I love Home Depot, y'all. You think dirt look like me, you should see me on Sunday. Prudential, MedLife, MasterCard, Pfizer, CVS, Boeing, FedEx, Fannie Mae, just to name a few. I've worked with Wall Street firms. I've helped to expand and train their leaders, and there's so much work to do. But diversity and inclusion, they're not just some PC terms. It's not about giving a handout. It's about expanding opportunities and making sure that your brand is spread all over this region, this state, and this country. It's not about moving anybody from the table, it's about making sure there are opportunities for everyone to sit around the table. And I often tell people, I'm not looking for anyone to move away from the table. Oh no, keep your seats, just scoot over and let me bring in some folding chairs. You should have seen me when I was campaign manager. I used to tell those guys, I used to laugh at them. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> I'm about to change all of this. <laughs> you see, when you open the door to people like me, anybody that looks like me, anybody who believes in fairness and justice and opportunity, what I've found believe when they created this great land of ours. I said, when that door opened for me, I kept it open for others to come in. When that ladder was put up that I could climb, I made sure that it was another ladder. And yes, when I got on the elevator and went up, I sent it back down because I wanted more people that looked like me, who had the spirit of not just being able to go out there and to create opportunities, but who had the spirit to serve. And that's what it's all about giving people opportunity. That is what hope is about. 
Hope is about making sure that we leave our doors each and every morning and find ways to open up another door so that more people can come into the circle of opportunity. That's what diversity and inclusion about is about. It's not about second or third degrees of support. It's about being able to have everybody at the same level so that everyone can enjoy the blessings of this beautiful land of ours. You know, now more than ever, the rapid changes in our nation's demographics demand that we look for ways to expand partnerships and create more opportunities to improve the economic situation and the economic status of minorities. Oh yeah, I said it. I believe it. Give a chance, give a child a chance. Someone took a chance on me, the daughter of a maid and a, the father who was a janitor. Gene and Lionel Ray, Cheryl, Sheila, Donna, Tate, Chet, Lisa, Demetri, Kevin, and Ziola. Put eight out of nine of us through college being a maid and a janitor. They didn't judge us. But they told us that to whom much is given, much is required. We can't go and sit in church on Saturday or Sunday or some people go to St. Mattress. I ain't mad at you. Bedside Baptist, I ain't mad at you. Our Lady of the Bath, I ain't mad at you. The Bible says pray without ceasing, and that's what we should do. But how can we worship a, a loving and gracious God and then come back and then scorn those who have not been able to make it to the circle of opportunity? Procurement, supplier diversity, it's about building bridges, it's about building opportunities. And that's why you're here. 48 years is not long enough. Soon it will be 49 and 50 and 60 and 70 and 80, and yes, I'll still be able to do the backslide. <laughs> but today, we celebrate. Today, we open new doors. And even if it's too much to open a door for others, open up a crack in the window, because sometimes just feeling that breeze, people know that there are opportunities, opportunity to give their services and their products, and to make sure that others can share in the blessings and to expand that brand. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come a long way in, in this great country of ours. And I'm always proud to say that this is the moment this is the moment we've been waiting for. I'm sure that those who gathered here on some warm spring day 48 years ago never envisioned the kind of audience and the kind of tremendous support and sponsorship we see today. You're in good hands. Yes, I know Allstate. <laughs> You're flying the friendly skies. And yes, Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is what 55 looked like. Y'all been taking care of my health. I just had to tell my doctor, I said, you know, you knew I'm gonna have to work into my schedule and I'm gonna have to make sure you understand that when you check my blood pressure and all them other things, it never gets high unless you work me up. I'm calm, calm, these sponsors. You're the ones that are opening up to see a possibility. You're the ones that are going to make a difference. You're going to continue to extend the brand and opportunities into communities all throughout this city and this region and this wonderful, beautiful state. I close with what my grandmother Frances, who was born in the great state of Mississippi, would tell us each and every night when she called us into the room. My parents were still working. And yes, she called us in order our birth. Cheryl, Sheila, Donna, Teddy, Chet, Lisa, Lemitra, Kevin, Zilva. Grandma Frances was an old, gracious, faithful woman. She was a daughter of former slaves, yet she never taught us anything about hatred. She was about love. She was a woman of so much joy. When I'm on ABC and CNN, I think about Grandma Frances because she was the only one in the family who didn't tell me to shut up. Everybody else said, shut up, shut up. She said, let Donna talk. Thank you, Grandma, and I will proceed to talk. 
But Grandma, I love her. Every night she would read scripture. And the reason why I want to leave you with that this morning is because the scripture she often read gave us some sense of hope. Hope in the most powerful sense. So if you ever turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 7, verse 9, remember those words. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. Ladies and gentlemen, 48 years, the harvest is coming. 48 years, we're going to plant those seeds of possibilities. 48 years, we're going to see our harvest in the next 10, 15, and 20 years because we're not going to give up. We're going to continue to extend it. God bless you all. God bless the great city of Chicago, and God bless the state of Illinois. Thank you so much. Thank you.